Thank Hi, you. Clint. Hi, Wynn. Okay. Wait, so wait, 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 before you say anything, how do I turn this off? My my son did it, and I don't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the, I think you go to uh, up up top, go to meeting preferences, or in Zoom, go to preferences. Go to preferences. So sorry, people. It's okay. Turn it's off beautiful. Virtual, virtual background. Is it your illustration, at least? It is, but I think okay. my son did it. I don't know how to get rid right. of it. Giving you that Medusa look. I like it. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> like you're wearing okay. a really great hat. <laughs> okay, here we go. Can so I have to turn it off? Uh, you just you just take it off. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, sorry, I won't continue. Well, I'll figure this out. Virtual my own. background. There we go. Uh, choose none. There you go. Got it. Hey, you have a regular home. <laughs> and coffee. Yes, and the coffee. So uh, bear with me two minutes, guys. Um, before we kind of have our kitchen table chat together. Um, uh, just a few words, uh, kind of prefacing things a little bit, because uh, we're, we're obviously, even especially this presentation, uh, we, we have to start from where we are. Uh, and, and that means also where the world is. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, first of all, welcome everybody. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Mark Siegel, Editorial and Creative Director of First Second. And, and some of you have been around for the previous sessions and every panel today has acknowledged in some way that we all count ourselves shoulder to shoulder with the protesters and activists that are standing up right now to right some great wrongs in our world. And, and we do. Um, and although there's much work ahead to make things better, I hope that First Second's 15 years of publishing so far reflects our fundamentally inclusive and anti-racist stance. And as First Second's founder, I'd like to add a small note, um, which may not be obvious to everybody. First Second has no political affiliation. We have authors and artists and staffers whose political views and backgrounds span a wide range, and we wouldn't want it any other way. I don't see eye to eye with all of them, but if they're making great books, they have champions here. So this isn't about political opinions. White supremacy and systemic racism are plainly evil and anathema to all we stand for. It's painful that we even need to say Black Lives Matter, but we do need to say it and keep saying it. And for many of us not black and genuinely wishing to be part of the solution and part of a bright and rightful future, it can be hard to strike the right note and, um, and easy to make a mess um, as we try. And one thing that can be difficult to grasp for someone who hasn't grown up black in America is that this crisis didn't just appear. It's 245 years in the making and more. Um, and first, second, wishes ardently to join the chorus shouting that systemic racism must end now. And for those who need help, um, this has come up now a few times. Um, I think for a lot of, of uh, non-Black non Americans, there's a need to learn um, and to better know. Um, so for those who are interested, I have one small recommendation. It's not small at all, actually. Um, but to put the events shaking our world this week in a big context, here's a book recommendation. It's called Stamped from the Beginning by Ibram X. Kendi, uh, because we're not gonna be able to show up as good allies with blinders on. So anyway, so that's uh, a little moment to just acknowledge the context um, and the times that we're in. Um, and, you know, we had a little prep session here, Lewin and Clint and I before, and, and I hope we can get into like the feel and the spirit of what that was, which was really like three human beings um, chatting. Um, I do miss Wynn's hedges though. Say I again? Mean, oh, the hedges. I miss her hedges. I can barely see your hedges. Up there. Oh, God, you know? the hedges. So the the actually not there. so great today. Everything's kind of gray, so I didn't go outside. I thought it'd be nicer. <laughs> So, okay, so this last panel, everybody, is not a presentation so much as a conversation. And with me today are two lovely creators, 
Lewin Pham and Clint McElroy, whose books happen to be, as Morgan said, two of our biggest hits ever. Uh, when <laughs> artist on Real Friends and Best Friends, written by Shannon Hale, and Wynn and I met when she was just breaking into picture books. Yeah. And since then, she has illustrated and or written over a hundred of them. And a couple of hefty graphic novels, I might add. In the yeah, next. yeah. <laughs> hefty is fair to say for that 500 pager, especially. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Clint is the author of The Adventure Zone. This is volume two adapted from the beloved podcast of the same name, <laughs> Sons. I like that. Um, That's good. I like that. <laughs> it's one of several major hit podcasts by the McElroy clan uh, with art by Carrie Peach, um, the amazing Carrie Peach. So, so here we are. Um, and <laughs> hi. Hi, Mark. <laughs> hi, Mark. Hi, Wynn. Nice to see you again. I miss your dragon hat. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. My sons, okay. they take the computers for the school year and they just keep fooling around with it. And every time I get it back, there's something wrong with my computer. Kids, so, huh? Just, what are you going to do? <laughs> um, hey, can I comment about something about me and Mark first meeting? I don't know if you've got a good first meeting with Mark story, but Mark was a designer. Were you a designer? You were just yeah. a like lowly peon designer. Yeah, who could totally. really talk. That, that was actually on my business card. Yeah, the lowly PR designer. <laughs> and he was, um, he was great at talking. He was great at chatting and he loved comic books. And I remember I had just started doing some books with Simon Schuster. You were working at Simon Schuster. And um, it was a really fun, exciting time. Strangely enough, book ending this time from that time, it was right around 9-11, um, right yeah. after 9-11 it happened. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I was trying to jumpstart my career and I managed to get a small picture book at Simon Schuster. And I think I did it in record time for them. Not for me, but for them. I think I got the book in August and I finished it in November. Okay, wait, I have to add something here because <laughs> this was not just like a little picture book with like a few doodles. So this was, this, as I remember it, so this was a Phil Bildner script, yeah. right? 21 Elephants. Yeah. And I remember my boss saying, there's this disaster happening with this project. Some other artists had failed to turn in and we only had like a ridiculous amount, just a few months to finish this thing. And this was not just like in an easy style. This was, it's Barnum, it's this true story of Barnum and Bailey's yeah. circus. <laughs> with the elephants, with the ballerinas on top of them walking across the Brooklyn Bridge. So it's like historical, yeah, right, period. And there's like crazy perspectives on architectural New York yeah. and elephants and ballerinas. And, and there's Wynn presenting like the first sample that I saw, it looks like oil painting <laughs> or acrylic or something. It's just like, it's painterly. It was insane, yeah. And it was insane. And I never saw a picture book be made so fast. And I was like, and basically when you turned it in on time, I think everybody at Simon & Schuster was kind of like, okay, <laughs> we've just stumbled into a keeper here. <laughs> and it's an amazing book. It's a beautiful book. Yeah, I think it's what I got to remember for. But Clint, you can remember this, you know, the next time you've got a deadline for one of your graphic novels. Got it. Yeah, that you're fast. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. But it was um it was a really great time and it was it was a fun book to do and I I remember that's when I met Mark afterwards was I think Mark you you said something you I don't remember exactly where it was but we we were out to lunch or something and you told me that you were just amazed how quickly I was able to do not the book but the thumbnails you were impressed by the thumbnails and you kept saying have you ever thought about doing graphic novels? <laughs> and I remember laughing at that thinking, who would look at these tiny little thumbnails and think graphic? And of course it made sense it was graphic novels. And so, you know, Mark kept sending stuff my way over the years and I kept hedging and some I'd say yes and some I'd be terrified and some I dragged my husband into making me do with them. But um, yeah. now it's been, you know, years later and look at us. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I think the first time I met Mark was at San Diego Comic Con. Yeah. They used to have a comic book convention in San Diego. 
That's right. I remember those days. And uh, I uh, walked up to the first second booth and this guy in glasses, which I later found out was Mark, said, hey, buddy, into the line. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. Wait a minute. This is a proper. <laughs> now, I'm writing. I'm creating. <laughs> but it was at San Diego Con, first time we met. Mm -hmm. Can I tell a bit of that con? That for me was that was very memorable. Before you and I actually met, I think we you and I were at a dinner table at some point yes. later, and yes. I that was marvelous. That for me was my meeting you story. <laughs> but so, but meeting the, the Max, that was so San Diego. And actually, this is one of the questions when you can think about as well is like when you, when you remember knowing you had a hit. Okay. But this, okay, so with, with the Adventure Zone, you know, I didn't edit it, right? So Callista, my colleague and friend, who's you, some of you saw earlier. Um, who is brilliant and amazing. She is. Callista Brill is Brill. And she um, signed us up. And this was a podcast that, you know, for some people was basically the reason podcasts exist. But then for a lot of people, you know, you could kind of go through life and never come across it, right? I was kind of in that category at this point. And so I was happy that we had this thing, this project, it was coming along, it was fun. And we were having some really strange patterns happening with that first book. Um, we, so San Diego Comic-Con, that was like several months before, no, wait a minute, that was a year before the first book came out, which I have here is uh here there be gerblins there are still right. copies okay <laughs> I have mine. um and we so we didn't have anything like we were bringing the McElroys over to san diego and we had nothing for them to sign <laughs> like for them to do we didn't have hardly any swag like i think we had like a few little pins um so i think i think all we really did was print up a postcard of the mm -hmm. And the deal was like, okay, the McElroys will sit at the booth and sign postcards, you know, for like maybe some diehard fans will come by and say hi and stuff. And they arrive and this mob, <laughs> and it's, we're talking within San Diego, you know, you're not like a stranger to what a mob looks like, but this is like huge numbers of people descending on this. <laughs> And suddenly there's this line that like, we're trying to like, we, we're out of control. There's, and there's all these costumes that I don't recognize. I'm like, wait a minute, who is, who is this person with the little lights under her hat? And like, you know, these characters, cause they're coming in cosplay, right? And, um, and San Diego security actually had to come and, and manage the crowd oh. to keep it moving around like three aisles. And then there was like later, I think that night or the next night, <coughs> in the gas lamp um, theater, mm -hmm. you guys were doing a live cast. Yeah. And it was like, podcast. and you, and you, we posted this online and in like four minutes flat, 1500 tickets just went. Wow. So we were like, this is, this is something different here. <laughs> and, and then I, I got a call from, from John Sargent, who's the head of all Macmillan, not long after. And we're like, at this point, I think the big, there was a big book coming out from um, the adult division, which was Fire and Fury, which is this big, big, big political book. And the, the numbers, the sales, the pre-orders were going crazy. But there was one thing topping it was the pre-orders for Adventure Zone. And, they, and it was a year before the book came out. And John Sargent calls me and he goes, um, I'm looking at pre-orders here and what the hell is the Adventure Zone? <laughs> <laughs> we still don't know John. <laughs> we haven't but quite narrowed. Went off and started listening, so and he was never seen again. But <laughs> <laughs> well, we've ruined many lives that way. Um, yeah, I, I think that was one of the moments. Um, um, uh, there have been a few touchstone moments where we said, "Wait a minute, what? What is this?" Obviously, with podcasting, you start seeing the big downloads. And, you know, we had uh, a really, and still do have a tremendous vocal, talented, um, tender hearted, embracing fan base uh, that has just been 
like nothing I've ever experienced before. And I think when we started seeing that presence from the fans, uh, the first live show we ever did was in Boston. Uh, the first live show for the Adventure Zone uh, was in Boston. And, uh, and, and I, I really think that was, that was another one of those touchstone moments. But that time in San Diego, where we, we came in on the far side of the building and we were still yards and yards and yards and yards away from the first second booth and came out through the little security tunnel. Yes, there are secret tunnels. Yes. Um, <laughs> and said, man, I feel sorry for wherever this line is for because it was a gigantically long line. And when we noticed that they were wearing red robes and taco <laughs> hats, we said, oh, wait a minute, <coughs> that might be us. <laughs> so that was a very cool moment. And then I, you know, you, you bought my dinner that night and I really <laughs> laid on the appetizer. So <laughs> thankfully you signed us for a second book. <laughs> so wait, you are going to tell us, tell about the, the, the Boston. That's where uh, it, was at, Carrie, it was at the right? Wilbur we met Carrie Peach, right? It's where we met Carrie. Carrie had done a lot of fan art. Uh, this is before we had ever met Carrie or, anything she had done a lot of fan art and we loved it so much that when we decided to do our first live adventure zone show in the wilbur theater in boston uh we we hired her to do the the show poster uh and uh, the reaction was awesome people loved it and we actually met the the three the four of us met with carrie in the panera bread across from uh uh, across the street from the Wilbur Theater, and that's when we first sat down and started talking about graphic novels and 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 everything else. Um, so that was cool. But that that show was also important for me. I, I mean, I've been on a lot of stages, um, appeared in front of large crowd, not to see me. Usually, because I was in radio, I did a lot of MC work, and the only thing people hate more than the uh, MC is, of course, the opening act. But, you know, you're right in there as MC. So I've been out there before. And when I when we stepped out on stage to do the Adventure Zone, just the, the place went berserk, yelling and screaming, standing in their chairs. I mean, for I mean, we, we couldn't even get started for like 10 minutes. And I've, it was a palpable wave of love and adoration and, and positive stuff like I've never experienced before. So that was that was an important day for us on a lot of different levels um, at the, at the Wilbur theater at, in Boston. I felt bad because we were supposed to have gone back and done a live show. Gosh, last month. And of course, you know, we're not able to, but we will be back. We will be back to Boston. And what about you? And like, when, when did you know, like you had like something, something different was happening? Is this, is, is real friends your biggest book? Would you say? I'm actually not sure. I, I do the Princess in Black series with Shannon. Yeah, that's huge too. Millions of copies too. I have, I've had such just a strange career because I don't really, <laughs> this sounds silly, but I don't really take stock of a lot of the stuff that's successful or not. Um, I think I learned early on that if I worried about that, I would have slipped my wrist and stopped doing this like 20 years ago because it's, it's, too, it's too hard to, to find out. There was, I remember a very surreal moment where I went to um, Disneyland with my kids and I'm the illustrator of the, the Vampirina Ballerina series too. And I know it got made into a TV show and all that, but I never paid attention to it. <laughs> and so we were going through- I have Disney to call my granddaughters. Yeah, I, there, there you go. I'm, I'm so out of it. And my, um, my boys were, um, they pointed out Vampirina walking as one of those big, you know, cosplay characters. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's that's mine. Look, they changed her dress, or oh, they changed her hair color. You know, I was making comments like that, and I hadn't realized it had become such a thing until I went to Walmart and saw, you know, band aids for Vampirina, which I thought that's the weirdest thing. It's a vampire. Why would she need a band aid? <laughs> <laughs> but that was when I, I think I, I've had this very surreal sort of distance from when my books do well and when they don't. And especially I think when the Princess in Black series did well, again, it was just something that was, I did with my friend, Shannon and Dean, they're, they're so much fun to draw with that I never paid attention to how well they did. 
um, I think it wasn't until we went to the National Book Awards, um, the National Book Festival a couple years ago, and it was me and Shannon and Real Friends had just come out and we knew that it was doing well, but it, we didn't know how well it was doing. Um, and we went and you know, at the National Book Festival, they've got the long lines queued up. Ours was the longest line around. And we thought for sure, okay, this is for Princess in Black or something, but no, it was all for Real Friends. And they give you exactly an hour. We couldn't get through everybody because I like to draw everyone's picture, of course. And I think I, I drew something like 180 pictures in an hour or something. And the queue was still going on and I had never turned people away before. So after they made us get out of the line, I turned around to Shannon and I said, let's just continue the queue over there and not tell anybody. They got really mad at us because apparently you're not supposed to do that. But I made sure to sign everybody in the line and my hand hurt for the rest of the day. It was really, really bad. That's but a good pay though. No. That's yeah. a good pay. Yeah. It was a good, it was a, it was, it, it was when I realized that, okay, we've got something here that, that I just, I didn't understand what it was that we had, but it was, it was big and it still seems to be pretty big. So. I'm what like, do your, what do your sons think of your, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I didn't mean to hijack. No, 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 no. What We're do just you, sitting there the kitchen table. What do your kids think you, when of your books? Do they, are they fans? They are, you know, they're not fans because they're not, they don't understand what a fan is. You know, it, it's what, it's, I'm sure your kids must feel the same way, right? I mean, it's, it's what you do. And so, and so they, they've just always been immortalized in my books. All their friends have been immortal. So for them, it's just a way of life. So when, when I pick up a book, they just immediately assume I know who the author is. Um, but they will, they will be very critical of the books that I do, particularly the graphic novels. I mean, they were really upset at the ending. Uh, there's a scene in Real Friends where Shannon does something that's somewhat morally questionable and um, my son came to me and he was crying and he kept saying why can't you change this aren't you making this book can't you change what she did and I had to explain to him the difference between a memoir graphic novel and one where you're writing the story because I had to tell him you can't change what actually happened and he was devastated because usually he gets what he wants right away like you know move the character add some ears I can do it no problem but I <laughs> yeah it's really funny. It was a funny lesson from tough to learn. But it is interesting with the, um, I think the relationship to the readers and the, you know, there was something you said, Clint, about the the nature of the Adventure Zone fans. And I, I've had like from my own, my own dealings and meeting um, Adventure Zone fans, like there, I've met some really lovely people. There's like the vibe there is not like any fandom I know and there, and it's very interesting. Like I've been, you know, we've had conversations a little bit about this where it's like, you guys are very, very protective of your fans and you've, you've put like, there's been a lot, a lot of care into what does and doesn't go into the books. Um, and then the fans are also very protective of you guys, right? It's, a, it's an amazing relationship. It's a two way street. Yeah. And, and, and we, well, I mean, we really, that was one of the, a big, a big priority for us. Um, because our fans are, have just embraced us. And let's face it, I mean, especially with the nature of what we do, the podcasts and also the graphic novels. I mean, you know, otherwise I might, we might as well just be mimeographing stuff and handing it out on the street. These are people that we are, you know, we exist because of them. And you have to you we have put a lot of work into it because you don't want that to dictate what you do because otherwise why would somebody be interested in reading it if it was exactly what they would have done um and so you know you 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 try to be true to the characters you try to be true to you know what they embody um and then and the great thing about adventure zone for for me anyway, is the fact that the, over the arc, the, the first arc, the balance arc, which we're currently adapting into these graphic novels, like any decent story, the characters grew and developed and changed. And, and that meant that when it started, they were terrible people. <laughs> You know, they, they were not, they, I always make the analogy and I still maintain it because it's to me very important that, that uh, Magnus, Merle and Taco were the Marx Brothers. They are anarchists. 
Right. And it was important to me as a Marx Brothers fan um, that we didn't completely lose that sense of anarchy. They, they always are going to be a little bit anarchists. Um, but they had to grow. They had to change. Um, because we got to a point in, just to, for those who don't know, um, my youngest son, Griffin, was the DM for the Balance Arc. And Justin played Taco, a wizard. And Travis played Magnus, a fighter. And I played Merle, a cleric. And none of us, they've kind of changed their stories a little bit now, but none of the four of us had hardly any experience playing D&D. And so we were kind of treading new ground. And so Griffin masterfully architected this amazing balance arc of which there were seven mini arcs. And we got about two arcs in and Justin and Travis and I started saying, wait a minute, this is something really cool. <laughs> um, and it was obvious that Griffin was crafting something to last and so we in an, in addition to them growing as characters we kind of grew as as participants in the fact that when we first started we only existed to mess up griffin's plans <laughs> that was our whole motivation and then we said well i guess we better play along with the story a little bit um but it all it, i mean we always always wanted to make sure that it was the arms were open to anybody that wanted to embrace the story. We were there to return that embrace. Mm. It's amazing. It's an amazing thing. Like uh, I think the uh, the change of like the the relationship to readers and audiences is like it, it it's become part of the creative process. You know, it doesn't. It's it's pretty fascinating. I've always, I was, I think we were talking about it before, but Clint, it was something I was wondering about, and now you've sort of answered it, about, I mean, essentially from what I'm hearing, what you just said, that you started off as deliberately kind of rough around the corners, annoying sort of people because you were doing this to aggravate your, your, your son. Um, yeah. But now you're, you've boxed yourself, boxed yourself into a corner and now you've got to grow these characters how do you avoid a Game of Thrones sort of situation where you listen too much to your fans and end up creating something further from what it was that you started off with? Well, I think the fact that we're adapting an existing story mm -hmm. um, and regardless of how we acted in the beginning, and I'm speaking of Magnus and, and Taco and Merle, as players uh, having a lark of messing with this this story. And to be honest, our, our motivation was pure. We wanted to entertain and we wanted it. We didn't want to follow the tropes. We wanted to make sure that we came up with different kinds of solutions for dramatic issues and for, for problems. And we didn't want to just do, you know, the, the same old, same old thing. Um, but the fact that the, the characters all started growing and maturing and I don't want to, spoilers, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but Griffin had built into the, the story an explanation for why they were jerks at the beginning and why they didn't have all this information and why they acted the way they did. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, I mean, we, we always tried to stay true to the heart of the characters. Um, and to do what they would do. Um, it, it's, it is a, a fine line, you gotta dance, but you know, I, 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 when we talked a couple of days ago, I made, I made the, the comment that, you know, if, if somebody doesn't want to like it, there's nothing we can do that's gonna convince them otherwise. Mm -hmm. So, I think we just try to be as true to the story and, and to be as, as open. I don't think we've ever, at least I haven't, um, I don't think I've ever, you know, taken a comment and, and made a change or made a decision based on what that comment would be. Um, I think it was more along the lines of, 
because of the nature of our fans who are so supportive and, and express, I loved this and very little, I hated this. Yeah. Um, to just keep doing what people love. Um, and, and I think that was, that was the way that we, you know, took that, that feedback from them um, because very, very little, very little, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to think of an instance where somebody said, well, I hated that. Um, I think you're always going to get fans to say, oh, I don't think, uh, okay, in my case, I don't think Merle would have done that. Well, I'm the ultimate expert on Merle. He did it. <laughs> so, you know, I appreciate your thoughts, and I love that you love Merle. Um, yeah. But I'm the, I'm the, final, I'm the final say in, in, in what Merle does or says. And, yeah. and like I said, when I think the fact that we have that template, uh, we have that in place, and we know where it's going, I think that makes it a, a, a little bit easier. Uh, I think it'd be a different challenge if we were making something up out of whole cloth, which hopefully we'll get to do someday. Right. I hope so. I hope so too. We're getting, so Morgan is sending me some really cool questions from the audience uh, and it'd be fun to sprinkle a few in. Uh, Wendy asks for all three of us, what makes a good relationship between the creative and the editor and publisher? <laughs> all right. I'm going to sign out. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm going to say, for me, it's um, trust. It's a huge amount of trust. There's got to be something there. Um, and, and I've always, I've actually worked with Mark, uh, with you, on two books. And then I've worked with uh, Connie Shu, who's another editor at For a Second, um, with the two graphic novels and the third one we're doing now. And um, I'm going to say that when, when you know that the person who you're working with um, one, there's no ego involved. Like you just check your ego at the door. There are three people participating. There's the writer, there's the artist, there's the editor. In your case, Clem, there's apparently an army of you know people. But <laughs> for me and Shannon, we've got each other, we've got our editor, and all we're looking for is to make sure that everything is working right. And it means that at no point do I ever feel like this drawing cannot change. It must, must go that way or that Shannon at some point in her story isn't able to say, you know what, no, let's move this around, let's make this work, whatever it is that, that makes this truly work. So there's that trust. And then there's just that desire to make everyone else in the group happy. Do you know what I mean? To feel like you're really doing your part to make sure that everyone knows, I'm so happy to be part of this team and I'm gonna make sure that you guys are all proud of what I did so that we can all be proud together. And I know that sounds hokey or whatever, but it is how I have lived my entire career is <laughs> just trying to make sure that every single time I get into a project um, that, it, that it's, it makes everyone happy. But collaborating can be tough. And I'm going to say one side note, I did do a book with my husband. And I remember um, it was, uh, I think it was Prince of Egypt was the first book that we did together. It was um, by Jordan Mechner and it was based Prince on- of Persia, Prince of Persia. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, all yeah, sorts yeah. of Prince of Egypt cartoon together. <laughs> we did all these princes of the Middle East, you never know. Yeah. Um, Prince of Persia, sorry. And um, I, I remember I had taken on the book and um, I hadn't told Mark that I was pregnant when he offered it to me. I was two months pregnant. And uh, Mark said, you know, we really wanna do this book. It's gonna be this big thing. And I finally had to tell him, look, um, I'm probably going to be delivering a baby when I'm delivering this book. So can I have my husband help me out with this? Because my husband is Alex Puglond. Amazing artist. He just, I mean, for us, he did the Spill Zone book. So oh, yes. Gorgeous. He's a fabulous guy. He's the one who really got me to love comics. Not you, Mark, sorry. And, no, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, no, he's and, the real deal. And he, he agreed to help me make the book. So we did it together. And collaborating with my husband, he was probably the one person in my life I've had the hardest time collaborating with. Oh, family's the worst. <laughs> it's so hard. Family's the worst. <laughs> they just think they know. But the you know, the, here's the thing. Like with me and my, my kids, I know I'm going to see them every holiday, so I have to get along with them. <laughs> well, no, wait, okay. I was pregnant, right? And we were <laughs> five months in, and I was starting to really show and I remember I had um, drawn up a page and I was sort of like, we were trying to figure each other's egos out. And I had drawn a page and I remember my husband looking at it and just 
I had never seen a diva up close before. And it was the first time I'd ever seen him just blow up and say, this is the worst design page I've ever. And I remember it was like, oh my God, you're, 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 lo you're looking at my, your pregnant wife and saying this. And I remember just saying, you know what? I really want some lemonade. You're going to leave the house and buy me some lemonade. Come back and then apologize to you and your unborn son. And we're going to have to figure out a way to make this work. And um, he came back. And after that, every single time he wanted to blow up about a design issue, he'd look at my stomach and then just sort of shrivel down and, and let me have my way. And go buy you a citrus-based beverage. <laughs> I know I always worked for me, but it was funny. Yeah. Uh, Wynn's exactly right. And I think that I would add <laughs> um, one of the words that, that, that you use that I think is the key is the collaboration. You, you have to, graphic novels, such a collaborative art. Uh, I, I come from a theater background. Obviously, theater is an extremely collaborative art. And you, you have to be willing to surrender mm -hmm. some things. It, uh, I, we, the boys and I can remember very early on, having a conversation um, where we said, you know, they know how to make graphic novels. <laughs> so we need to trust them. And you're exactly right. You have to trust. Mm -hmm. And for us, another key component was love. Anybody who's become involved in anything we've done, whether it be the, uh, the, the, the books, the graphic novels, the the other projects that have come about. We've got a card game. We, I mean, all these other things that have, have happened have come from people who love this story and have come to us wanting to get that story out there. And with Callista and Allie uh, and everybody, I'm not just, I mean, I don't want Mark to hear this, so I'm putting <laughs> um, and And Mark himself, they have all been so supportive of that um, that it's it's meant a lot to us. Now, the four of us don't always agree on everything, um, so you know that it's it's learning to collaborate. You're right, trust. It's learning to trust the other people. Trust your publisher plus trust your editor, and for us, trusting Carrie. Um, I Carrie Peach is a freaking genius um she is is amazing and and everybody in that whole scenario are really terrific collaborators and it's all done from a very positive thing now i'm sounding hokey um, no, but you know what the good stuff and the real stuff of life it kind of comes out that way but it's well, it's yeah. true it's like that's why cliches are cliches. <laughs> Some cliches. Yeah. I mean, we're, you know, I feel like from the publisher end, you know, what makes things, um, I mean, it's interesting, the stuff that's coming up, you know, about like when ego doesn't rule the day. Um, and it doesn't mean it doesn't flare up sometimes, you know, it's like, but it's not, it's not what, what governs the thing down. And we've had only, I mean, with first second, you know, we've had, uh, many projects over the last 15 years or so. And, and there's been a couple of instances where some teams really fell apart badly, like where, you know, people were like no longer speaking to each other and stuff. And they were, oddly enough, the two that I'm thinking of right now were not teams we assembled. Um, they were teams that came to us fully formed oh. and they were best of buddies. And they, you know, it, and then it was like, we were suddenly like mediating, you know, between them and they couldn't be in the same room it was like it's like pink floyd recording the wall in like four different studios or something but anyway so so um when that happens is that it it feels like something breaks like i believe i really do believe in the mojo of a project like i think a project and and it and a lot of it goes into the how things begin and I think if things begin on the right foot and there's like certain kind of fundamental agreements, there's like, you're kind of setting out on that, on that campaign together, yeah. you know, and you, you know, like you you have like, there's certain terms and certain agreed to things. And eventually what you want is you want the project to be the boss, yeah. you know, ideally rather than have one kind of tyrant, even a benevolent tyrant, but the, the project becomes the criteria. And, and then 
it's amazing. It's amazing what collaborations can do. I mean, I try to encourage our, the first, second creators to do a bit like some of the French cartoonists do, which is to switch between solo and collaboration projects. Because you, you go into these collaborations and you're forced out of your own patterns and working with other people, you know, like you were saying, Clint, is like you're gonna, you're gonna have to let some things go and you're gonna have to kind of like be okay with bending a little about certain things. You know what, what I've kind of discovered about, I mean, I've done a hundred plus books and I, I know the ones that, that start, stop, start, stop, and they're really hard to get through. And the ones that ease through, those are the ones usually where the project sort of becomes its own entity. And yeah. the minute you stop thinking of it as yours, but as just a something, it's so much easier to, to do everything you can to keep it floating because you know you're not the only one holding it up. And there's, there's something to that. I, I've found in the last, I wanna say five years or so, um, where I've started to very actively decide, these are the people I wanna work with because these are floaters. These are people who know how to keep projects going. These are not people who are got the most Twitter followers, who've got the biggest social. No, these are just people who I know can do this and want to keep this thing going. And every single time that I've chosen someone like that or that I've wanted to work with someone, it's always proven to be true. We're, we're just keeping this really lovely thing afloat. And, and it doesn't feel like it's your own anymore. And in fact, half my projects, I think it's part of the reason why I do feel so distant from them is I, I set it out and I want to keep it going. And I don't feel any responsibility for its success. I don't feel any responsibility. I, you know, I'm like the Johnny Depp of movie going. I just don't go see any of the, the movies or anything after they're done. But I'm so happy to be, to be part of making that thing that floats and, and being and knowing that I'm not the only one supporting that thing. And when it exists on its own as its own entity, that's when you know you've got something really special and it belongs to everyone at that point. Yeah, I silenced about, you. Uh, <laughs> thing about the projects that escape their creators are like the most exciting. Yeah. It's like our kids, right? <laughs> Don't say that. Don't say that. Come on. Our kids are still well, young. Well, yours are younger than mine. Mine are like heading into the teenage years and they're like, they're preparing. They're preparing for their escape. Yeah, wait till they hit their 30s, pal. Yeah. <laughs> and then no, you start tell me you podcasts talk. with them. <laughs> yeah, I don't even remember their names. I hope I have some Jason cool and Trevor. Oh, listen, I've, I've told you before, I am the luckiest guy on the planet. And I'm not, I am not exaggerating. I honestly feel that way. I, I, hey, listen, I have three adult sons who like hanging out with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy, man. That's nuts. <laughs> Something about that. Don't jinx it. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm knocking on whatever this substance is that they <laughs> told me was wood. Um, <laughs> yeah, and not only that, but want to travel around the country with me and, and do stuff with me. I, I believe me, I take that with, I mean, I, I'm so thankful that I have that kind of, kind of relationship. And, and I've, I, I am reaping the, 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 the fruits of um, their mother, Leslie McElroy, their late mom. Um, I have said, and I told you the other day, both of you, I mean, I'll take credit for them having a knowledge of comedy. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I mean, because we worked on that. We, you know, we had dinner at our house was always a competition between who could make their mom laugh, not me. Ah. Uh. But their mom made them the terrific human beings that they are. And I honestly feel that way. I'm, I'm extremely proud of what they've done in podcasting, but I'm really even more proud of the men they are, uh, the husbands they are, the fathers they are, the members of the community that they are. And so the fact that they, these guys still want to associate with me, I don't know how that happened. Yeah. <laughs> but their mom awesome. gets the credit. That's pretty awesome. That. Pretty awesome. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're into, you know, there's some question these days with like, I mean, with the pandemic and with just like the sweeping, turbulent change that's happening, you know, it's like, there's some question about the relevance of what anyone does, you know, and I, and I feel like, you know, the, what you're talking about, I mean, I think also, you know, some of those human qualities that you're kind of circling around in, in that, 
you know, that's what people feel. That's what, that's what gives like a project a, a something else, like an extra glow, you know, and I, and I think that is more relevant than ever. Um, I think the qualities that are going into things it's, and it's not, and it can be, it can be goofy. It can be serious. It can be like, there's all different kinds of things and all, and people need all different kinds of stories, but, but that part is, um, is the part that, that's, that counts. And I think today, nowadays, it's like, that's where people are getting food. Yeah. It's food. It's like, it's nourishing, you know, and I think stories, what's making things relevant nowadays is that they're either nourishing or they just seem dead and lifeless and irrelevant, you know, and, yeah. and it's great. I mean, with these two projects, like, it's not just that they're hits, you know, I think it's, it's, it's that they are getting widely embraced. Yeah. That I find fascinating. And we've had, it's funny because for a second, you know, we, started becoming financially really successful in 2013 right it took many years and over that time you know we were basically always kind of following our following our our north star you know and, and occasionally i would be like okay you know what i'm going to cook up like a scheme for a project that's going to be a cash cow Every time I tried that, they just tanked. <laughs> they just never made a dime. They were just rejected wholesale. Nobody wanted to touch them. They had that aroma about them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so it, it's, uh, it, it's, I think what it does is that it kind of helps you focus a bit more on the inner qualities of things, you know, you and, know, and including the inner qualities between people working on something together. You know, what's funny was um, I know when, um, when Chen and I started to do Real Friends, it was a project I think Mark had, um, Mark had said that uh, Shannon and I, Shannon Hale is the author of Real Friends and, and we've done uh, a bunch of other projects together and we're very, very good friends. But she had uh, hesitatingly shown me the script for Real Friends um, thinking, you know, well, I just wanted your reaction to it. I, I didn't want to ask you to do it because she thought I was too busy. And then I think, Mark, you said that you had the script on your, your desk and that you were thinking you wanted to send it to me and you didn't say what it was. And then all of a sudden out of the blue, I get it from somebody. And I remember um, getting the book and thinking, this is gonna be a quiet book, I think. Like this isn't gonna be one of those big successes because it's such a, it's a very quiet, tender book about um, what a girl has to go through in this bullying situation. And, I remember feeling the pressure coming off because anything Shannon Hale is high profile, but I remember the pressure, co pressure coming off thinking, we can do what we want with this book. We don't have to you know, necessarily listen to all those voices out there. And it felt just very personal. And it felt like I, I could really put my heart out onto the paper and not worry about a million people crushing it. And we, I don't think we got paid very much for it. There was no expectations from it. And when the book came out, feedback that we got from some of these kids who were reading the book, it was almost like we went out and found every kid who had ever felt slightly bullied in their life and they had somehow found this book. And the responses that we would get at some of these conferences, I remember one girl saying, I go to sleep with my book, like I'll fall asleep with it. And parents send emails saying, yeah, we find the book tucked under their pillowcases and it's ratty and it's torn and it means, it, it means it's been read over and over and over again. Yeah. And there is something amazing. That's like when you realize, well, this is not just our story anymore. This belongs to everybody. And it's those moments where you realize the intent was to make it, to feed some part of yourself, to, to fill some hole inside you. And you don't realize that there's a universal hole that's felt by so many people out there. And when you touch that, I, I think they call it zeitgeist, but I'm not sure. When you touch that, that intangible something, and it's not very often that it happens, but when you do, it's, it's amazing. It's like, it's like being in a church, you know, when everyone's singing choir at the same time and the electricity that everybody feels zooming through their body, like it's like that, but in a way where I know it's happening everywhere and I'm just not able to see it, but I can still feel that electricity. That's amazing. That's really amazing when you're able to do that. And I think graphic novels does that in a way that no other form of book can do. And I'm not sure why. Is it, is it the well, fake? Well, there's two things. I mean, I think what some of what you're talking about, I think is, is art. It's like you're, you know, it's art. It's like, in, and it could take any form. But, so it's like, but, you know, but it does happen to be that like right now, 
comics is going through this strange, amazing renaissance and, it, and it's a very vital medium right now. It's like, it's very much of our time. Like there's other things, the podcast is also a very vital medium. You know, the radio play had kind of like fallen away for many years and then suddenly boom, the podcast is the thing. And, and um, so actually, well, we have to wind down and, and um, kind of bring this to a close soon, but I'm well, the, kind of- We don't have time for me to pitch you on my big cash cow idea. Oh, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. We totally About a billionaire like cow, that, a but. billionaire cow travels around the world spending his cash to, well, no, I'll, I'll, I'll no, 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 you're onto something, you're onto something. I'll draw it. Thank you, someone yeah, no, in the audience. To draw it. Someone yeah. is already drawing it right now in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> There's a future Carrie Peach out there. I had to say it out loud. Trademark, trademark, trademark. Copyright, <laughs> copyright, copyright. <laughs> but you know, I mean, just to, to kind of, um, you know, about the comics thing and the graphic novel thing, what is it, you know, what is it about you know, Clint, your background is in radio and theater and, and when you, you kind of came to comics from the picture book, which is, you know, it's a cousin, but it's not, it's not the same. It's definitely a different form, different format, different uh, constraints. Yeah. So, so what is it like in a brief way, like what do you find uh, about, like since you, you, you've come to the graphic novel, what have you found um, it does well? Comics, comics have been part of my life a lot longer than radio was or even okay. theater was. I mean, I grew up reading comics. I can remember six years old, my dad buying me a Superman annual on with a cover of Superman with a head of an ant and a face <laughs> of Alfred E. Newman. I swear to God, I'm not making that. It was not some drug dream from the 70s. Are you sure now? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but comic books have always been an escape for me. I think the combination of reading and, um, and, and the visual part of it, I mean, let's face it, comics were doing what movies and TV couldn't do until recently. Mm -hmm. um, and, and with comics, you are still bringing part of the interpretation from your own head. And they were such a balm for me. I can remember after my dad died, my, my older brother took me to a, a five and dime and bought me like a stack of tower comics with the thunder agents. <laughs> and I can, I can remember reading those and getting through these tough times. And it is a powerful, evocative, still medium. And I mean, and the graphic novels are, I mean, the, the slightly older brother of of comics but i mean it's yeah, the same, the same basic same. concept yeah yeah i think i think graphic novels are um having done very many other books <laughs> everything from chapter books to picture books i would say that most of the forms of literature are monologues something that's being told to someone graphic novels are dialogues mm. the reader has to bring something to it and there are moments where they can pull away from the words and they can read the faces and there's something to that because there's a communication between the reader and the object. So it's, there's, there's something coming in between. And I can't help but think that you can't get that on TV, although it's, it's close, right? Um, because it continues to go. You can't stop it. You can't dwell. You can't keep zooming and, and stopping at a page. But I've seen kids, especially my sons, they read graphic novels all day. And there'll be times where they'll have a book and they'll just be staring at a single page for the longest time. And I don't want to interrupt. Like they kind of go this dwelling mode sometimes. Yeah. I think yeah. I do that too, but I don't see myself. But, but I notice them doing that where they kind of gaze. They do. There's something there where they're trying to figure something out. And, and I never like to interrupt at those moments because I know that there's a connection that's happening there that I don't want to interfere with. But that you get, I think, from graphic novels because it presents so much to you. It gives you a lot of information and it gives you the time to process it, which is not something I think other mediums can do. And I, I hey, think- You that, are the editor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you are the, you, like a, a film editor, you are the editor of how long you dwell on a scene. Or oh, a as shot. a reader, yeah, 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 yeah. And the reader is I, the editor there. I, I mean, as the art, the as the artist, I get very nervous about um, where I place camera, where I'm going to establish eye shots, because I know that where I place the camera, where I have the angle of that shot in that scene is gonna determine how those kids enter that scene. 
So if I want a sad moment, I'm going to lower the camera. If I want a happy moment, I'm going to wide out. All these things you subtly think about. And it's just amazing when you, you watch kids literally like floating existentially <laughs> through, through space into the comic and that's how they're entering it. And as the artist, I know that you're the writer, you get to do all, you get to dictate this world, but I get to be the eyes of the world. And that's, that's a fun way to get these kids to enter into your, your brain. And that's kind of what we're doing. But I think that's why graphic novels have done as well as they are and why they're being embraced and why they take storytelling a different way and why kids, they get something out of it, they absorb and then they come back and they're able to take literature in other forms because they've learned how to process it already through this, this medium, which you can quote me if you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm stealing. Yeah, this is so I'm cool. I, I, I kind of wish we had like um, the rest of the evening to keep chatting together. Yeah. It feels like we easily could. Um, so I want to thank you, the two of you, especially for joining me for coffee um, this fine afternoon. It's actually, it's very lovely spending time in your company. Um, thank you also to all the other First Second creators who were throughout the day here sharing their passion, you know, their, their work and their, they are one of the, the great loves of their life, which is making these amazing books. Um, and, and especially not to forget there's Morgan, and Melissa and Madison and Katie behind the scenes here. That team, I mean, you see little glimpses of them if you watch the festival, but they are just putting so much care and, real, and love into like the making of these festivals. There's just so much attention to everything. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really remarkable. So thank you to you guys behind the scenes. And I guess this is it for this session, last one of the day. Thank you, Clint McElroy. Thank you, Lewin Pham. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for having us. Thanks, Mark. It was great being here. <laughs>